Hey, I'm talking to Cheryl Dixon. Uh, she is a communication strategist and fractional chief communications officer. Um, we recently met once again uh, via the Peter Winnick, Bill Sherman group uh, on thought leadership on Tuesdays. And also uh, a, a co-friend of ours, James Kerr, said we should really speak. So uh, here we are talking. Uh, uh, Cheryl, it's so nice to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with you. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, James. He is the master matchmaker indeed. He is. He's, 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 he's strong that way. He's got superpowers that way. Um, Cheryl, uh, you recently wrote um, a post for uh, PR Daily, and the subject of it had to do with um, the relationship of, of business acumen, which is mm -hmm. kind of, an, in my mind, is almost like an old school term, business acumen, uh, and you related it to goal setting. Um, what's the relationship between business acumen and goal setting? Uh, great question. I, I, it's actually the second article in a series I'm doing for the publication. And the idea came from the need for communications professionals to have greater, let's say, business acumen or business fluency so that they can be more effective and more strategic in their communication planning and strategy, as well as the other leaders in the company to be able to better understand how communication strategy can help them achieve their goals, solve challenges, meet their needs, and calculate ROI. That's excellent. I'm wondering, um, you spend a lot of time uh, helping people uh, work through how they should be communicating with their out, the outside world, uh, potential customers, with partners. What have we, you know, how has that changed this year, given all the craziness? But, but um, how are you recommending that clients of yours uh, should change their, or, th or think differently about their, their communication plan? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, of course, you know, this is the business as unusual, as everyone knows, and we're living, working, communicating in an environment that is just unprecedented. And I think that just there are more macro considerations like the outside world, our environment, the issues that everyone is so concerned with outside of the normal day-to-day -day business that companies, brands, thought leaders, company leaders are having to consider. And you know, they're often faced with the choices of, do I need to make a statement about something? Do I need to acknowledge something? Do I need to make a stand, take a, make a statement, you know, take a stand or take action? And you know, we're seeing a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking mm -hmm. on companies that kind of put themselves out there and perhaps don't do it as well as others mm -hmm. think that they should. Mm -hmm. um, but there is you know, a lot of pressure on companies to be able to talk to some of the issues that are on everyone's minds. Do they do do companies or organizations have to take a stand on some of these uh, social issues, or or should they just try to avoid those conversations? You know, that's an interesting question. You know, because there are companies that may put out a statement and then they'll get flack for not doing more. They might, you know, do something and then they get criticized for not doing even more or not making putting their money where their effort is. I think that it really depends on the type of company, the size of the company, and who their key stakeholders are and their, um, their, their level of involvement. I think that certainly employees are looking to their companies, their employers to do the right thing, or at least to be cognizant of what is on their minds. You know, there's a whole slew of data that show how employees um, trust and expect their companies to be socially involved, you know, pay attention to corporate social responsibility and care about social issues as much as profits and profit holders. But, um, you know, I think that a company's ability and willingness to do more than just to acknowledge really depends case by case basis. Well said. And finally, Cheryl, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody. What lessons have we learned over this past year, whether it's COVID or economic challenges or presidential elections, whatever, what lessons have we learned this past year that we must not forget going forward? Oh boy, yeah, it's don't let a good pandemic go to waste, right? Without <laughs> those lessons. 
Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that there are so many lessons. Um, I think, you know, again, from my perspective as a communications professional, to be open, to be transparent, to keep the communications flowing, um, to not wait until you have all the information to start communicating, to keep that open dialogue. And I think there is just an increased need to be nimble and to say, and, and, um, and also to be human. What's, what's fascinating to me is as we are Zooming and as we are working virtually, we are you know, being invited into each other's homes and we're getting photobombed by dogs and children <laughs> and we're getting a glimpse into just you know, more personal. And I think that that is an interesting way of working and has made us relate to each other a bit differently. And also there is not going to be an excuse anymore to not let people work remotely because we're figuring it out. So I think that you know we're we're going to come to some semblance of a new normal. Mm -hmm. I hate using that word because it's so cliche <laughs> no. and overused. But you know the I think that just being nimble, being flexible, being a bit more open minded, um, understanding you know risk and you know being being more being more human. That's excellent, Cheryl. It was so nice to meet you and spend time with you here today. Uh, best of luck on everything and have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much and best of luck. Have a fantastic weekend.